and then go to the title company, pick up the check. The first time this happened, it was like, it was a life-changing moment. Yeah, but listen to how this deal plays out. Okay. This is what wholesaling just tugs at your emotions, okay. dude. I emailed the buyer and all three of my partners, and I was like, please tell me these numbers are not as bad as I think they are. All four of them. Dude, those are terrible. The, N the NOI they said was 104, turned out to be like 70. And that decreases the value a lot. He just got a phone, he turned down a 50K offer because the guy couldn't close for two months. Yeah. We said, hey, we'll give you 22,000, we'll close in 10 days. Yeah. Which is literally unheard of. You go to an apartment or say a house in Phoenix, they're asking 2,000 a month, say, hey, I'll give you the 2,000 a month as long as you let me rent it out in Airbnb. And he'll make $5,000 a month. I think the most beautiful thing is that you can always, you can do whatever you want, you can always change your story and there's no limits. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are now gonna be talking about real estate. We have Austin Koss joining us on the show. What's up, Austin? Alan, how you doing? Thanks for coming back on. It was great, yeah. Usually I know when you're coming to town and you just hit me with the text a couple, couple days ago and I was like, let's go. Let's Cause I know this. we did this a couple months ago, so. Yeah, last time was yeah. I think January. It was I think I was going back from Christmas and then, yeah, that's when you're in town. That was when round one was and you were progressing in your entrepreneurial endeavor and now we're gonna be unpacking the progress. I'm pumped for this. For those that don't know Austin's background, he's a real estate investor focused on locating off-market properties, managing short and long-term rentals, and investing into long-term value-add apartment complexes. You can find the links in the bio below to metastonecap.com, webuyhomesuefalls.com, and toptiermg.com. All right, Austin, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Yeah, good question. I knew something like this was gonna be thrown my way. Um, I would say, I just have some thoughts just on the political climate because that obviously takes, everyone's talking about it. And my biggest fear is I think it's, be, it's becoming, at least in America, where, you know, there's, there's so much divide, it's becoming, it's becoming embarrassing to the fact that we're not even talking about real issues in this country anymore because it's election season. So literally, from now until election season, it's literally gonna be one side trying to take down the other side, not talking about any issues. It's just gonna be total chaos and it's gonna play into Trump and then Trump's gonna get reelected, in my opinion, by a landslide and then it's gonna be four more years of chaos and then, I don't know, I, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a time where there's a lot of uncertainty and I think it's interesting just to kind of analyze because then there's all, all, then there's stuff going on internationally. Um, I try not to pay attention too much to all that stuff just because, I mean, we're entrepreneurs, we gotta be laser focused on what we're doing. But, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes the news, you just turn on the news and it's just like, what's going on here? I don't know. A sense-making mechanism for civilization is so important and the tribalism and echo chambers and cognitive ease and all the biases that we have and the uh, algorithms and news feeds that exist right now and the corrupted business plans focused on the attention economy, all of these things are playing out into a wrecking of our sense-making mechanism that we need, we need to be able to make sense of the existing social fabric and how to make it better. When you have polarized perspectives on given issues that are just trying to hurt other people rather than actually listen to each other and try and make progress, we have a very sensitive time ahead of us. And if we want to make the change, we need to work on that sense-making mechanism. I completely agree. And, and what do you think about the media part of it? Like, did you see the article that the New York Times, like, they hired a team just to focus on, like, r the Russia investigation? And now that that's gone, now they have a brand new team just trying to talk about tr Trump's racism. So, like, that's not even, that's not reporting. Would you agree? Like, that's, I think that's the most dangerous part is that, like, the media is becoming ridiculous like especially the mainstream media like we keep hearing it from trump but it's like 
I mean, you literally can't trust people. It's opinions. It's, it's not reporting. It's mostly opinions. And they don't tell you that it's an opinion article either. They, it's just like, Ma ah, main sad. Mainstream media is also being, has some gatekeepers. It's called kind of like the gated institutional narrative that kind of protects whatever stories are being distributed around the planet. That's why independent media is actually really, really important. And for people to fund independent media is critical right now. So what you can do is you can focus on a sense making mechanism and you can focus on trying to find ways to impact yourself, your own divine connection to source and work on yourself. And then that immediately affects your family, your community, your entire social fabric around you. So it really starts from within and then that usually catalyzes significant change around the world. But it has to start from within and it also has to start also from a realization that some of the things outside of us need to be updated from its archaic fabrics. Okay, let's do um, where, yeah, let's do where we've been going in the last nine months. So where have things What's transpired for you and the guys in the last nine months? Yeah, so I think nine months, yeah, so that was in January. That was when we, we, me and Dylan and another partner, we had just gotten started, just kind of wholesaling, finding off-market properties for investors, just that process. We hadn't, we hadn't made a deal. We're Let's talk of, about that for a okay, little bit. Yeah. Off-market properties and wholesaling. Yep. So properties that are not listed on the market. So yeah. owners that want to just get rid of their homes and they just decide, but they don't want to list it. They just want to work with someone. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. I mean, say there's a $200,000 house somebody's lived in for, you know, 20 years, not in good shape at all. Like it would be worth 200,000 if it was like this house, like kept up nice and clean, then it could, it could be listed. But a lot of these people don't, don't take care of it. They would have to put in money before they could even list it or try to sell it as is but then pay realtor fees anyways. So a lot of times they'll just be like, hey, we don't wanna, we don't wanna use a realtor. We just want you to give us an offer. We wanna close as quickly as possible. Um, can you do that? I'll t and they, a lot of times they even say like, we're willing to take a substantial discount. So, and the reason this is so valuable is because I, right when I got into real estate, I tried to find all my deals online, Zillow, all these different spots. And I quickly realized you cannot find good like fix and flips, good rentals, because maybe it's probably just because it's in a good market right now, but everything's so, you know, there's so many deals out there that people are selling for higher prices. So there's not that many deals on market. So these investors that are, you know, hoping that I can find these deals, they're, they're like starving for deals. Like right now I have way more buyers than deals right now because no one can find good deals. So that's where it becomes a very valuable thing. And then it's obviously, the better deals you find, the better you get paid for it. So obviously if you provide a service, you're gonna get paid for it. But again- What are you doing with the property? You have to buy it, if it's a $200,000 property, you buy it for what, 100,000? Yeah. And then, and then you have to do some sort of renovating to it in order for it to be able to go on market and be sold? I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's of, do it. I'll give you an example of the first deal we actually closed. So we got a lead, we hired a cold caller, because at this time we were in state, we were at State Farm, we just couldn't like prospect throughout the day. We were talking about that a lot. So we actually hired a cold caller from the Philippines for like eight bucks an hour. And so we got her a list of like a thousand and she got this lead. And then after work, called the guy. Long story short, his dad died 10 years ago. It was his dad's house. It's vacant now in Baltic, South Dakota, small town in North of South Dakota. And he's been trying to, he wanted to like renovate it. He's, life happened, you know, like he never came around to it. So he's like, I just want to get rid of it. He's like, I need 30,000 for it. Um, I'd like that. Some property back taxes, yada, yada, yada. Went out there, told him, couldn't give you a 30. You know, is there any wiggle room? He said, yeah, definitely just give me an offer. And then I said, all right, you know, best we can do is 15. Yada, yada, yada. long story short, we got it under contract. So we signed a purchase agreement between me and the seller you know, his name's Ryan. And then for, it was $17,500, a contract purchase agreement that I was gonna, I would buy it from him for $17,500. But I have the option to assign this contract to another buyer. 
Mm -hmm. So I have the option, I can do either at this point. So once I get into the contract, I actually already had a buyer who said he'd pay 25 for it. Okay. So I called the buyer, said, hey, got it under contract, um, what's the best you can do? For various reasons, we, he, he agreed for 23.5. So I signed it to him, 23.5. The difference between that, what is that, 3,500? Oh, six, 6,000. Terrible, terrible six, math. 6,000. So the difference yeah. is that, so I, so I sent both of those documents to the title company. They do all the work at closing. I don't even have to show up to closing. Um, what was this last part? You sent yeah, this yeah. buying agreement. Yep. You're buying it for seventeen five from the owner. Yep. The buying agreement says in the contract that you can then assign the the, the whole contract. The whole contract yep. to another buyer that's going to be buying it from you. Yep. Okay, and they were buying it for twenty three five. Yep. Okay, you gave that. Um, they agree to that. The, you, everyone's agreed on that. So does the the seller doesn't even need to know that you're doing this other part of it. He doesn't need to. He doesn't need to know. Um, I told him just because I'd like to be transparent because I think at the title company they can probably see. I I don't know. I actually don't know this for sure if they can see the price that I signed it for. Yeah. But I just told him. I said, hey, got a buyer that would likes this. Um, he asked if he could pay me a fee if he could get the deal. They've never had an issue with it. But to your point, yeah, like, so I got that one contract and they got the assignment contract, which is just a different contract, sent both contracts to the title company. To the title company. Which does like title search. They're the ones that make it official. They're yeah. the ones that actually. So, and then at, at closing, the seller and end buyer, they're the ones that actually show up to the title company. I don't. And once, once both parties sign, Getty calls me or emails me and says, hey, your check's ready, come, come pick it up and then go to the title company, pick up the check. The first time this happened, it was like, it was a life-changing moment because like, I thought I was so intimidated by the whole process. I didn't think it would, you could do it. And so many things came up through this title process. And I was like, this and is you don't work. need to get any sort of uh, nope. licensing in order to pair together a seller with a buyer. You don't nope. need any. It's the only way to get paid for broker in real estate without a license. And I actually had to talk to the South Dakota Real Estate Commission because a bitter agent actually called me and he said he's gonna report me because I, I, you have to have a license. And I was like, go for it. Because I knew I, did. I knew I didn't. Like I even had a lawyer tell me it was illegal, but I knew it wasn't. So Real Estate Commission called me up and I just told him exactly what I was doing. And, he, and it's funny because he's like, yeah, technically you're right because that, that specific issue has never been addressed in the South Dakota law. You know, I was like, sounds good. So let me know if I have any other issues and I haven't heard from him since. And I was gonna, I was gonna like call up that agent, but not and, worth it. And this is called then um, uh, just, uh, just buying and selling off market properties is what this is called. Yeah, it's called wholesaling real estate. Wholesaling, wholesaling real, real estate. Why is the word wholesaling used? Well, I think, I mean, you can wholesale anything. Yeah. Basically, just buying discounted things. You can buy discounted buying watches. Buying discounted things and selling them. That's yeah. wholesale. Yeah. Okay, that's Finding why it's off-market, disc deeply discounted investment property. Deeply discounted properties. Because think about this. Okay. Think about this. I mean, if Apple stock's $100, you can't buy it for 50 But technically, real estate, you can if the seller agrees to it. So the right if situation. If the seller of the stock does, too. No, Apple can never allow that. It's insider trading. It's illegal. If, if someone owns Apple stock oh, themselves like if they and have wants like, to sell it on the stock market for, for a disc, because they themselves just want to. So they could, I think they would have to gift it. I think they would have they to, would gift, have the to gift the stock. I think they would, because you can't. You definitely you can't. Could, uh, if, you, if you did know who the buyer was, then it would be different than if you knew who the buyer was and you were selling it under. Even then, I see where this is all going, that there, there are likely it's, rules and regulations here because you can't sell under the, under the current uh, bid, the current it, ask yeah. price for it. Yeah, and that's why, and that's why it's so cool because like, it's the only asset you can actually buy like legitimately discounted. Like we, well, you could buy uh, cars or you could buy yeah, any that, type yeah. of other, you would list watches or boats or planes or you know, really, no good investments. Though. Those are not, none, none of those are really good. Those investments. are depreciating assets. Yeah, yeah, these, exactly. You can't really buy an appreciating asset discounted. 
interesting except real estate. Except a real estate. And like maybe an old car, uh, even an old see, car. Like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. like some of those cars they appreciate. Or like an old, uh, just an old like vintage item that could appreciate yeah. depending on what Some the weird item stuff is, like that, sure. yeah. Okay, but these are like bigger deals. You can get 6,000 bucks. So, okay, so how did you, so the, the person in the Philippines that was doing the calling identified the person that wanted to sell it? That was the, that was the first identification moment. Yep, so we got a list from, actually a different VA, a virtual assistant, got me a list of like a thousand in Minnehaha County, which is where Sioux Falls is at. A thousand, a list of a thousand properties where it absentee owners, which means the owners do not live at the property. So it's either vacant, it's a rental, what a second house, whatever. They don't live there. And I just How did it, this person find this list? So it's all public record, but I will say in some counties, it's a little bit, in some counties, it's harder than others. Like it's harder in South Dakota, like we're moving to Arizona and down in Arizona, a title company will give us all these lists for free. But in South Dakota, it's actually pretty hard to get some of these. So like, can you do what you're gonna do in Arizona? Yeah, it's actually easier, but a lot more competition. Okay, so buying and selling. That's where um, it all started wholesale, basically in Phoenix. It's all started Wholesale Phoenix. started in Phoenix? All the gurus are in, gurus, like the, the teachers are the in teachers Phoenix. The teachers are all, in Phoenix. Big, the big players are in Phoenix. So like, like a good spread in South Dakota, like the difference, that's the spread, spread of your assignment yeah. fee. Good ones, 10,000 in South Dakota, there's 50,000, it's happening all the time in Phoenix. Because people are irrational down there. Bigger markets, they just get irrational, especially in a good, in a good economy. So it's gonna, be, it's gonna be, but there's a lot more competition, so we're still, we're gonna see, we're gonna see how it is. Cause I like Sioux Falls because there's not that much competition. I know the market very well. Now I'm going down there, totally new market. But you have a little bit of uh, tentacles. You have tentacles in Sioux Falls that are yeah. staying here. Some of your team is gonna be staying. Yep, Okay. exactly. Okay, and then how did you find the buyer for this first one that you're giving us an example of? So right when we started out, we had to find buyers before we even started looking for deals. We knew we had to get a buyer. Cause if you get a deal, they were to say, if you get a good enough deal, you'll find a buyer. But I was like, ah, I, want, I want some buyers. So all I did was we created a website. Um, and it's, there's a company called Carrot that specializes in websites for real estate investors. Because hey, you know what like an opt-in ad is? Mm. Like the click funnels, mm -hmm. like you mm -hmm. click here to get my free ebook. Yeah. And then you click, get the free ebook, but then they have your email address. Yeah. So my website had a similar opt-in page, click here to get local off-market real estate properties. And then put that on literally Craigslist. And within the first probably two weeks, had like 40 buyers. And then that, that channel kind of cooled off a little bit, but not, and then just some networking, go to meetings and you find people, you talk about what you do. On the golf course, I've gotten cash buyers. But the first batch of them for this deal, the first batch was uh, from that online ad that I put. And, and then I actually met up with them quite a few times before the deal. So that's the, that's the big thing. Like some people say you need a ton of buyers, but I think you need, you know, some good ones, just yeah. a few good ones yeah. that actually can close. And then the idea would be you hopefully don't invest like 600 hours into this close because then you'd only be making 10 bucks an hour. Yeah, and I would love, yeah, maybe eventually we'll talk about like, some of the some some of the failures because a couple months ago i invested so much time into this massive deal that was gonna pay us a lot of money it fell through right at the end and we spent so much time that our pipeline wasn't very full so we're still recovering from that like month that we thought these two deals big deals were both gonna close and it, it was a more it was a shot to the heart like we were like but I think it, it happened for us because it, it happened, it, yeah. Because we were getting we learned. Because we, we were like, dude, this is easy. We just had deals rolling, and we had like five in the pipeline. We were just like, this is too easy. So I think it, it humbled us. It, <laughs> it it brought us back to zero, and now we're like, now we're back in the hungry mode. But I think you need to, when you're starting out, I think that you need to get like that punch in the you need to get you that do. punch in the face a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> Because even my dad was like, geez, this looks too easy. I'm like, fuck, it feels too easy. <laughs> but then it quickly, like, the universe is like, yeah, it's, life's not this easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it teaches you a lot. It's all lessons learned. That's yeah. all it is. So then walk us through what the, followed, the next deals were. Yep. So uh, there, was a, there was one deal that it was actually, oh, you're going to love this. So we got a call. Dylan got a call, um, said, hey, saw your 
advertisement, I'd like to sell my house to you, whatever, didn't ask any questions, just went over there the next day, met with them, and they said they, I quote from the, the, one of the husband, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been, I drive by your sign, your billboard every day, and I just thought I'd finally give it a try. In my mind, we don't have a billboard, but there is somebody that does have a billboard. We buy houses, Sioux Falls, or we buy homes, Sioux Falls. So we have to leave from their billboard. <laughs> I, was, I was just not gonna say anything. I was just like, I looked at Dylan, I was just like, yeah, you know, I'm glad you gave us a call. Oh, yeah. But like, I think, I mean, <laughs> but the situation was a $185,000 house. Um, where is it located? Cliff Avenue, over by Sioux Falls. Okay. Um, you know where it's at. What's the intersection? It's uh, 57th and Cliff. 57th. A little cool. bit, a little bit north from there. Okay. It, but it's on Cliff. Yeah. So it, it didn't sell for like 190 the year before. So she's like, "Hey, we need to get out of this. We'll just take, we'll just pay off the mortgage. We, we can pay off the mortgage. This is what it's at. What's your offer? We offered her like 140." And she accepted it, and then we assigned it to one of my good cash buyers for 149. So that was, that was a good one. And then congrats. That was so that's two. That was like right after. So I was like, okay. And then. Uh, and how did you? What, where is this? Man? Where is the 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 trusted third party that says that this is what was that person called again uh the title company title and this company is, that, I, there's multiple title companies and you have to pick one that's trusted or so I, yeah we didn't i didn't talk about that much and that was actually crucial because before i even started getting deals i needed a title company that could actually execute the deal yeah. and since sioux falls they all the new trends just get to South Dakota last, it seems like. No, most of these people had never even heard of wholesaling. Like, they didn't think you could do it, thought it was illegal, so I had to call every single, all five title companies in Sioux Falls. Finally, one of them said that they could do it, but I had to talk to the president, because he's the only one that deals with it. So, like, it took me a week of call, kept calling this guy. Like, I need, like, I'm getting closer to a deal, I need to know. Finally, he called me back at work, we had an hour convo, told me all this stuff. He said, yep, you can do it. Whenever you come across these, just make sure you email it to me because I'm the only one that knows how to do it. So he, like the first deal, he, I had so many screw ups and he just helped me through it. He's like, no, nope, I'll fix this, not a big deal. So he was, that was crucial because like. What were the screw ups in the? Like right? within like the contract, just little things like. Like what? Who, um, so one of a big thing that we, one of our big selling points is that we pay all the closing costs. Like, what, if we say 135, you're getting 135 no matter what. In the first deal, um, I didn't, like I said, buyer to pay all closing costs. But there was a couple costs. It was a title insurance fee and one other fee, I forgot what it was, and I, I didn't specify. So right before closing, he had to call me. He's like, hey, um, who's supposed to pay these fees? And I was like, put buyer, yada, yada, yada. So then he fixed that right, uh, right, right last minute. Yeah. So what were like, those fees, like a grand or two? Or? Yeah, so usually closing costs, if there's no realtor involved, probably only like three to 5% of the total purchase. But I mean, you know, 150,000, what's that, yeah. what is that? You know, it's a decent amount, so, but it's, it, I think it's more so, I mean, they're saving $3,000. It's more about the hassle, because we can close quicker. But yeah, I mean, the title company's crucial. Um, so that one went well, and there's a couple more deals. And then, really the big one, they really, this kind of took off everything. I don't, I don't know if we want to get into like the apartments, but this is kind of how. Let's do it now, This sure. is kind of how, the, this is how the apartment, that all started. Um, I had a deal, it was one of my, like my third deal. I sent it to all my cash buyers, and one of them called me, left me a voicemail over the weekend, and I didn't really, I was like, hmm, must be interested, called him up, and he goes, hey, um, I'm actually not interested in the property because I can't buy anything else until you know, I sell my apartment that I have in Iowa. And I was like, what? I was like, oh. I was like, really, what kind of apartment do you have? He's like, 48 units, you know. Um, it's cat, it's, it's, it brings in the NOI, net operating income, which is where you, that's how you value anything. He's like, N NOI, 104,000, um, you know, we could probably, you know, 600,000, we could probably sell it to you for. And I was just like, wow. I, Cause I, I've, I've, I've analyzed enough big deals where I knew, I don't know a lot about that yet cause I haven't bought one, 
but I knew those numbers were absurd. Net operating income after all expenses besides, of managing the property. Besides and debt, renovation. minus the debt. Minus the if debt. There's a, if there's debt, if there's a loan on it, it's minus that. Okay. So the debt service. Okay. And then, but obviously- 600,000 for 48 units? It's in a small town of Iowa, and they only, each unit only got like- 500 a month or 450. something? 450. Um, yeah. But see, here's the problem, because the NOI is big, 104,000. Yeah. And I had a buyer who was like, for sure, let's do that right now. Let's get this going. And then, I, and then, and then he's like, you know, why don't we just go in it together? Like, you know, why don't we do a joint venture? If you can raise some cash, you know, then we can do it that way. And I was like, holy cocks. My, my long-term vision was always to find apartments, bigger deals, and then have investors. Yeah, recurring invest in, income. Yeah, well, the investors buy into the deal. deal I manage yeah. the whole deal, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. That's apartment syndication. But I, I that's thought that apartment was, syndication. That's apartment syndication. When you get investors to come on to go into the purchase of an apartment complex, yeah. and you manage the whole thing, including the person that manages the actual property yep. afterward, and then you pay out the investors a portion, and you just take a management fee of this yep. entire process. And typically, you know, typically if you have ten investors each in at ten percent, you want to be one of those at ten percent because you. You don't have to do it this way, but you want your money aligned with their money. Cause I mean, think about it. Yeah. If <laughs> this guy had no money invested, you know, yeah. but so, and I knew that was that, that was the long game, but I didn't think I could get there that fast. And then so I'm like, holy cow, I could do this right now. So I called up a lawyer. I was like, how do I do this? Yada, yada, 20 K legal fees to get all these documents. But he's like, it's doable for sure. Um, and we ended up, we ended up where he just wanted to, he just wanted to pay me 25 K just to get, do the deal himself. So yeah. I was going to wholesale it. I, I had it under contract for 575. He was going to pay 600. Um, as long as, because we were going to do a non-refundable earnest deposit. Usually, when you get into an apartment deal, there's so much due diligence where it's like within 30 days you can back out, and get all your money back. But these guys wanted to do like, since they were giving us such a big discount, they wanted us to do like $10,000 non-refundable deposit. And I was like, okay, well I haven't seen your numbers confirmed. So if we can do that, then we'll for sure do that. So he's like, yeah, not a problem. So he sent us over the, all the numbers, and I was like, all right, this is the last thing, then we're gonna get this deal closed, everyone's on board, title company's on board, everyone is ready to go. And this took up a month of my time. I drove down to Cherokee, Iowa, visited the whole property. It took a month? Talk, yeah, back and forth. Talked to these guys back and forth like every day for a month. And finally, um, and, then I, and then I looked at the numbers, I was on the golf course, and I, I got my email. And I probably looked at it for like five seconds and they didn't look as good as I thought. So I emailed like, I emailed the buyer and all three of my partners and I was like, please tell me these numbers are not as bad as I think they are. All four of them, dude, those are terrible. And then, so the, N the NOI they said was 104, turned out to be like 70. And that decreases the value a lot. So basically, the deal fell through, told the, told the guy like, hey, you lied to me, I mean, I'm sorry. And then I never heard from him again. So I took about a freaking month. And I was You so learned a lot. Learned a lot. But that was 25 oh grand you were God. hoping to make and- I thought, yeah. I thought it was there, I thought it was there. I was like- mm. You learned a lot about apartment syndication, which you're really I know, interested I know, in going I, into. I know, I, This what, is interesting, these like lessons from this higher- The universe yeah. just always throws you lessons. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. You gotta see them as lessons to learn from them. It's all about your perspective. Everything's yeah. coming at us, but it's like, how do you perceive what, what they yeah. are? Like, yeah. it's all about. Your are these things har harming you or hurting you, or are they there to teach you and for you to stay resilient? I think the best. Uh, I think the best quote is like, "Life doesn't happen for, to us; it happens for, for us." us yeah. And I didn't hear that until recently. It's like if you just simply think about it, if everything, anything that happens in life, if you always be like, "Oh, why'd that happen to me? Like, wh what did it teach me?" Like, yeah, dude. My perspective has changed so much. Yeah. Like same that, that's what we did. Cause like this fell through and Dylan goes, dude, don't worry, don't worry, Awesome's happening for us. And I was just like, yep, let's go, baby. Yeah. Like it actually yeah. like legitimately helps you. Okay, so what are the other upcoming deals? Um so we had a we had a well um right now we're actually not wholesaling a deal because me and two partners are moving down to Phoenix. So we don't want to just leave everything we built in Sioux Falls. So my good buddy from college, Ethan, he's moving up to Sioux Falls. And basically the agreement was, you know, we're not gonna like pay him a salary, we'll give him a percentage of the whole, like, 
of like the entity and um, we'll buy him a duplex so he doesn't have to pay for rent. So basically, we're getting him a duplex. Uh, th this is, this is a kind of a universe type thing too because it was coming down to the wire where I, I was trying to find a duplex. I was like, I was trying to, because I wasn't, I was not gonna look online because the big thing with duplexes, if you're gonna live in one side is you gotta make sure that the side you're living on is smaller, or well, it doesn't have to be, but like you wanna make sure that the other side can pay the mortgage yeah. so you can live for free. Exactly. And I happened to cold call this guy like wholesaling and he wasn't taking me seriously. I had talked to this guy for probably 20 minutes. He thought I was just dipshit and finally I, I kept like, I was persistent. I was like, Chris, I, I need to buy a duplex. I'm not effing around. I, I would love to buy this duplex. Are you serious about buying? Finally, he's like, yeah. I mean, yada, yada, yada. And we finally agreed on a price and we're actually gonna like, he's gonna, Ethan's gonna live in like this bottom unit that's one bed, one bath. And the top unit, is like the whole house. So it's like four beds, two baths, can probably get 1400 a month, and our mortgage is gonna be about 809. Yeah, that's huge. So it's gonna be, so even if we got a thousand, like we're not gonna, you know. Yeah. So it's like, that's that's my big thing with it. I annoy, I, I annoy my friends so much about this. It's like, why would you eat, why would you pay rent or buy a house when you could just buy a duplex and live for free? Mm -hmm. That's my two cents on real estate, because it just <laughs> makes too much sense. Unless you're in San Francisco, it's kinda hard. <laughs> there are no <laughs> duplexes in SF. I don't think you could wholesale yeah. in San Francisco. I wonder what... Uh, San Diego you can. I know a lot of people Oh, interesting. Do. Yeah. Now, California is not only yeah, pricing, but also the regulations and rules that are there. There's uh, these like in-law units and things like that. Oh, They're yeah, kind of interesting. If you wanted to maybe live in one of those and rent the house, <laughs> things like that. That's sort of how this one is. Yeah, that's right. It really is. And also just um, all the stuff that we're going to talk about with Airbnb, there are a lot of crackdowns that are going on right now. Yeah. A lot of people are kind of pissed off at people for just buying houses and just airbnb them and increasing. Really? The, I yeah, know. yeah. I mean, it's interesting the comparison between how hotels are trying to like get people mad at Airbnb so hotels can try and keep more of the market share. Meanwhile, the it's it's interesting that it is being democratized to people being able to you know sleep in extra rooms and stuff like that. That's totally cool. At the same time, it's like there are artists and entrepreneurs that are trying to be creative in these metropolises and they can't afford to live there because people are buying second, third, fourth, fifth homes and just trying to rent seek and rent seeking is a major problem in real estate it basically came down to you are literally adding no value to the economy all you're doing is increasing the price of the rent at that property and then what you're doing is you're making it harder for artists or entrepreneurs or other leaders that are coming through that are trying to make value additions to the metropolis area and to the world, you're making it harder for them. And you're actually also kicking out other people that live in those areas that can no longer afford those prices. So there's gotta be some sort of a deal, uh, a, a balance here where we do a, a let people go and do cool things like Airbnb. But if you're really trying to make money Bring something of value into the world. Make an idea yeah. happen to come to fruition. Don't just jack up prices or buy properties just to jack up prices so that you can try and make money on that. People do that because it's easy. But what they're doing is they're literally hurting creativity. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, I mean, real estate, I guess there's, there's not, it's pretty cut and dry. It's just a capitalist thing. I kind of I know what you mean about the rent seeking. You know, if you're not really adding value, and that's why I I feel like if you're going to be in real estate, you, you really do got to have a clear purpose of why you're in real estate. Because I think you know I think I want to change the, my my purpose is to like I think in, investing in real estate is a better way than investing in in 401k. I think it's the best investment you can make, but I don't think enough people want to do it because they don't know how to do it, and I want to provide that vehicle for them to do it. How would someone? ethically invest into real estate without rent seeking, that type of thing? Um, well, I would say, I don't know, but I would say everyone needs to invest in something to grow their money. So I mean, the moral thing, I guess, why do you invest in bonds? I don't know. Like, cause I know what you're saying, but at, but at the same point, people who have money they need to preserve their money because they don't want to lose it. 
and I know we could go back and forth on that. Um, but as far as, I mean, investing in real estate for the moral, is that kind of like... In whatever, whatever thing that's being invested into, is it, in a sense, are you reshaping rules and regulations to propagate your own market advantage, or are you trying to invest in things that can then unleash the creative potential of other people from around the world? I think, see, I think, I think that, I think once you get into development, I think that's where you can get into the creativity, where you can develop things for specific businesses, stuff like that. Um, <sighs> okay, we can, we can revisit that. That's, a, that's an interesting question, though. I don't know how to answer it, because, I mean... It's a tough one. It's ethics. It meshes ethics with but capitalism. Is it, but it, is, uh, is investing in real estate unethical? I mean, if you're no, price-gaging... No, no, no. It's, gauging, not, if, it's, it's not unethical to invest in real estate. It's probably more about this whole idea of rent-seeking. Because that's a term that I haven't even... I haven't it's, even it's thought an, about. It's a really important term. Right? Is it something that happens in California? It or happens what? everywhere around the world now. Just if you have money, what you do is you go and potentially buy a second property and then you don't live in that property. But what you've done is you bought a property that you then do things like just say, hey, the rates in this general metropolis are around, let's say $3,000 a month for this house. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put this house up on the market for that amount of money. Once that's cranking and making me money, I'm gonna buy another house in the metropolis, put that one up for three as well. Over time, I'm gonna see my neighbors that put a house up for three, five. I'm gonna start putting mine up for three, five. I'm gonna do my best to try and get the tenants the least amount of rights possible so that I can most easily and effectively increase the rent to 3,500. That extra 500 a month is so meaningful to me being a multimillionaire. It's so important for me to get the extra 500 a month. Whereas literally for a tenant that is that has, if it's a four bedroom unit that each one of them is paying about a thousand bucks a month or so, those four people that are living there likely don't even have the extra $500 for, to foot for a bill for their car or a bill yeah, for their but- health care or anything. So there really has to be a deep amount of empathy that goes from people that are owning these properties and people that are renting them. I think the free market kind of determines that though because you can't just like raise it and I mean, because people will go somewhere else. But I think with real estate, though, like you are provide you're providing something legitimate. Like you're providing housing, especially if you're doing Airbnbs. Like you're providing a nice vacation rental that's better than a resort. So I mean, in that aspect, I mean, there's a lot of nuance on this topic. Everywhere. There really is. Yeah, I mean, you're right because you, I know what you're saying too. Well, you also you, you also have a different perspective because you live in literally the highest rented place in the world, probably the world. One of them, yeah. But but at the same time, the people that own the properties, they can't just, the only reason they're increasing is because the other people are, you know? <sighs> There's so much nuance on this subject. <laughs> yeah, I know. There is. Okay, so let's, so take us through the, um, the, the, the most recent and steps as you've been deciding to leave to also focus on uh, the Tempe area in Arizona. So yeah, take us to this time period now. Oh uh, yeah, so it's been a, it's been an interesting transition, and we're actually so we haven't really talked about it, but me and two of my partners, Brady and Dylan, we're moving down to Phoenix. Brady, he's already there. Um, me and Dylan are leaving next Monday, and we were initially going to do it in June, but we had some we had that's when our first couple deals started rolling, and we were just just way too much going on. We there's no way we were going to be able to leave, so we pushed it back. Um, like I said, because we didn't want to just up and leave all the things, we, connections we've made. So since then, the transition really has been getting our new, our new partner, Ethan, a duplex, which has taken up a lot of my time. Yes, yes. Taken a lot of my time. Um, but that's paying for itself, which is great, which frees itself. him up to do the yep. Sioux Falls side of the wholesale. Real but estate. there's going to be a lot of, we're going to have to train him because he's been working his job. So like Dylan's been, he's, he's done a big guide of like training guide for him, which will be good. For future people that you recruit? For future, like, because now we're doing standard operating procedures. I didn't even know that was a thing in business, which is embarrassing. Because, <laughs> like, like, basically, like, you got to be able to, if, you, if I die, somebody's got to be able to pick up exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. Know how to do it. So we've been developing that so that, like, Ethan knows what to do so that he can kind of, like, I mean, obviously we're going to help him, but so he can kind of run on his own up yeah. here. Yeah. And, then, and then just kind of getting into the kind of repeating what we did, have done in the Phoenix market. So that's kind of where we're at now, big transition mode. 
this week it's kind of going to be like moving, moving on, getting out of everything packed. But yeah, it's been it's been a process. This summer's been literally the most <sighs> craziest summer. Learned the most, um, failed the most. Total deals so far? Um, just three. three. Total of 25k though. 25k, three deals. And what was the last deal? So there was that house on Cliff 57, the Baltic house that you first mentioned. What was the third one? Ah, uh, what was it? I'm trying to think. Oh, what was this deal? I'll think of it when I tell you about the, this other deal. Um, because there's another, there's this other big deal that fell through when that apartment deal fell through. Oh, so that was a big dagger. Oh, this one. Okay, this one was uh, their. Uh, the six-year-old couple, their son has been living there, paying him like cheap rent for like 10 years. Um, Stop paying him rent. She just wanted to get rid of it. Um, that one took a while, probably a month, but we bought it for 45. Where was it at? Uh, by Whittier, so like well, north, by Whittier, north yeah. part of Sioux Falls. Actually, yeah. a couple blocks east of uh, downtown. Yeah. Um, this 40, one, 45. That's, but listen to this. Yeah. Uh, this is crazy. It's so, pretty cheap, isn't it? Yeah, but listen to how there this was, deal plays out. Okay. This is what wholesaling like, just tugs at your emotions, yeah. dude. So 45. And I had a buyer lined up at 65. Signed a contract. 65 contingent on inspection. And I was just like, I was a little bit weary about that. I was like, I mean, obviously he can tell that this is pretty run down. He, but he just wanted to like rent, get it like rent ready and just keep running it out like a slumlord, which I don't really like that. I, mean, I hate that type of stuff. Well, do you see what I'm saying about okay, rent seeking? So that type of stuff, I know what you mean. If you're not, give, if you're not giving them a good place you're to live. You're literally a buyer to buy a property so that you can then rent it out. I get how if this a is a capitalism spot, thing. I get it, but it's also very, 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 this line of nuance here is really tight. It is, it's really hard. It I think it depends though. Cause what if you're giving them a good place to live? That's legitimate. That's a legitimate okay. service. All right, all right. Let's continue. <laughs> yes, please. Continue. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so he's out for sixty-five, and I'm like, "Holy cow, twenty k!" And then, money, contingent on inspection. Contingent on inspection. Okay. And, and I had just this bad feeling. I was like, Ugh. "And this was on a Friday." I was like, "Ah, oh, here we go." So then Monday morning, um, get a text. Deals, deals done. Inspection, foundation issues, and I'm just like, "Dude." You saw these issues, like it's 40, that's why it's 65, like it's worth 150 if you actually fix everything. But he didn't want to, so he backed out. And at this point, I had three days. So when you sign one of these purchase agreements, there's, a, there's, a, there's like a time period, like a due diligence period where I can back out. And I only had three days, or two days. It was a Monday. By the end of Wednesday is the last time I could back out, else I had to buy it for 45,000. So like, so I'm like, oh my God. I have literally, the rest of today, Tuesday to find a new buyer. So I emailed all my buyers and I called a couple of them and I said, hey, I got a deal. Um, somebody just had it on a contract for 65. I'm willing to take a substantial discount as low as 48,000 if we can get a quick close. Cause at that point I just wanted to like make sure that I didn't screw over the seller. Cause yeah. if you start screwing with the sellers, your whole company's like, that's bad. Yeah. That's what the real estate commission does not want. So oh, if you screw that's the, the sellers. big thing. Cause they're trying to protect the sellers. So. As in the seller already believes that you're able to take care of it. Exactly. Yeah. So that's where the, so I was like, I mean, I could have bought it, but I didn't really want to. It's too much work for me. It's I don't so want, much work. It's a big fix and flip project. Yeah. And then it happened. So, so that was a Monday. That previous Saturday, I was up in Brookings at a baseball alumni thing. And I was downtown, met this guy. It happened to be a real estate investor, a big time investor. And that Monday, just had this guy's number for the first time, called him up and I said, hey, I got a deal for you, um, for, you know, $48,000, told him the whole situation, need, I need an answer ASAP. He goes, awesome, I'm actually in Sioux Falls right now, I'll go take a look. Literally, 30 minutes later, all right, I'll take it for 48. The guy I just met two days prior. Yeah. So like, it, we only made, it, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't make that much, but like, yeah. I was like, yeah. wow, so I was good. Yeah. And then right you got at, out of it. Yeah, but see here, see here's yeah, where it took a great. turn. See here's where it took a turn because that's where everything was going pretty well. And then that owner of that deal, um, his good friend saw that he was selling it, and he contacted us and said, "Hey, I have a duplex I want to sell." We go over. He accepted it for twenty-eight thousand dollars, and this is the best deal I've ever come across. Wait, twenty thousand for a duplex? Yes. In where? It was uh, so it was like two blocks. East of uh, 
east of like Phillips Avenue or whatever. So like right where development's coming. And like the block over had already gotten a letter this year saying they can't sell to anybody except it's the Sioux Falls because they're gonna like tear them all down. So like this is prime location and it's a duplex, twenty-eight thousand dollars. Why was this guy trying to sell it? Because for that this guy was it's all about the situation. Okay. What was this guy's situation? He uh, he needed some cash. I don't even know. He, he's trying to get out. He was just trying to get out. And this is the guy that house. sold his house for forty five, his friend. His, his friend, friend who yeah. actually while we were at that house, he actually drove up. And oh. said, hey, are you guys the ones that are buying up the whole block? Oh. <laughs> Literally said <laughs> that. And then, like, so we went and visited this guy's house. And I'm telling you, the best that I ever came across. $28,000, a buyer. Oh, oh this, is, this hurts me. So I got a, we got another contract on a Wednesday. And I had a buyer going to go look at it on a Friday, 3 p.m. That same buyer, same buyer from Brookings. No, the same guy. Same guy. So I got, hey, I got another one for you. You want to come down, maybe at 3 p.m. So about 2.30 I get an email from the title company saying that there is $53,000 in liens against oh, that property. Oh, that's why he was doing it. No, no, no he didn't no, know. He, he didn't, didn't know. know. Because he, the only reason I emailed the title company is he goes, hey, because he called Dylan. He's like, hey, Dylan, I just, I just, I think there's a, quite a few liens. I totally forgot this deal might not happen. And I was like, dude, don't worry about it. We'll be fine. We'll figure it out. So I emailed them, got it back. Sure as hell. There's one for 1,000, one for 600. One for 19,000, one for 11,000, all of a sudden I'm like. What are those liens for? They were like judgment liens, I don't even know. I think they were just like, I don't even know how you get that uh, many judgment uh, liens. How, what is a judgment lien? Basically I think they owed somebody money and then they took them to like court and said, hey, there's a judgment. And they um, put it against their property. Their property, because so they didn't they sell pay it, them. Yeah, so yeah. whenever they sell it. Uh, so, that, so literally, I did this at 2.30, call up Brett, the buyer, he's coming yeah. out from Brookings, told him the whole situation. He's like, well, I mean, you want me to still come take a look at it? Like, I think you can still get, get out of that. He's like, I think I've done that before. I've, you can get those liens down or whatever. Yeah. So he comes down, we look at it. He goes, well, let me know if you can get, if you get the liens figured out because yeah. I'll pay $44,000 for it right now. That's $12,000. I just heard him say it knowing, I don't think this is going to work. So we spent like the next two weeks tr like trying, to get, the trying to get the liens down. We got, got them down to like 40 and I was just like, dude, it's not, it's gonna, not, work, it's not gonna work. So that that fell through, right? Similar <laughs> when that apartment fell through. Right. So that was tough. Those are great lessons. Such great lessons. These are great lessons. Yeah. Tell, let me tell you about the, the actually the coolest deal that we got. We didn't wholesale because it was too good of a deal. Got a, got a call on Friday. This guy from California, like, hey, I got I, you know I got a couple houses in Canastota. I got like some hotels. I need to sell. Yada yada. He had like a, his main hotel burned down in California because of like litigation. He wasn't gonna get all that money back for a couple of years. So he needed to sell all of his like South Dakota assets. Long story short, we got a $90,000 house for $22,000. I could have wholesaled it for 40 right at the, at the close. But I was like, dude, this is an amazing deal. It brings in 850 a month. I just, my, I, my dad, I was like, hey dad, you wanna make some money? He loaned me $22,000, give him 10% due when I sell it in 12 months. So there's no liens against it. We own this property free and clear and it brings an 850 a month and the tenant right now um, that's living in it and wants to buy for 90,000 when the lease is up. So that's the best deal I've came across. This deal, this house, like when I told somebody that Why I had for 22,000. Why did he sell it for only 22,000? Because he, because the contingency was I needed a thousand dollars in escrow the next day and we needed to close in all cash within 10 days. That's unheard of. That is unheard of. 10 all day cash close, in 10 all days. Because guess yeah. what? He said he turned down, he just got a phone, he turned down a 50K offer because the guy couldn't close for two months. Yeah. And we said, hey, we'll give you 22,000, we'll close in 10 days. Yeah. Which is literally unheard of. I can't yeah. believe, and I, that's this before I asked my dad, I was like, I'll, I'll get away. If we oh. get it, I was like, Dylan, if you can negotiate and get this for 22,000, I will get the cash. Yeah. Calls me back, he goes, we got it for 22,000. <laughs> I was like, no fucking way. And then I, uh, my dad is outside, I was like, dad, we gotta talk. And like, he was all about it though. Like, he loved it. He's like, yeah. he's like, where was this property? It's in Canastota. That's so. It, it seems like it's Canastota. How far away is that from here? Uh, thirty minutes west. Thirty minutes west of here. It's kind of it's it's, it's that, that's why pa it's past the uh, no before Mitchell, right? Yeah. Good thing about like single family homes is like they still kind of keep their value because there's always going to be a buyer that's willing. To, you know, they kind of want you know whatever. It's different than like an apartment in Canastota. But mm. yeah, I mean. 
It was such a good deal. I had a couple of buyers who were like, hey, like, who can get host? 22 grand in cash uh, for a property in 10 days? That's the thing, yeah. Exactly. He just wanted to move it as fast as possible. And then he was trying to sell us his freaking, he had like a bunch of motels in small towns. He was trying to get us to like, he was giving us insane deals on these motels and we were trying to like sell them for him and buy them. But nobody he couldn't give us, us. He couldn't give us, he could not give us good enough numbers he couldn't verify the expenses and income because his yeah. bookkeeping was terrible yeah that all the investors were just like we can't, we do, can't it. do it yeah. but we could have had unreal deals on those too yeah so it's all about the situation that's why it's that's why it's cool but i mean okay so uh, all right let's let's <laughs> let's let's get that that's this last one so that we have there been four then total then with this one yeah i but, guess that's another one because yeah. it's about to close once the tenant finishes his lease he's gonna buy it the tenant's gonna buy it yeah 20. so we already own that one yeah but we're gonna sell because it well yes you have to pay for tax wise we don't want to sell it because he buy it right now but i don't want to sell for 12 months because you have to pay 30 percent tax Ooh. And, oh so that's see that's one of the see this is one of those little tiny uh like anti uh uh in a sense it's like it's one of those little rules and regulations on capitalism that kind of makes it so that you can't just buy a property and then immediately sell it because you don't have to pay exactly. that 30 percent tax exactly and but i yeah. wonder if that's across the nation or if that's state by state it is it's it, across the nation yeah well it's it's it's, it, it's the difference is long term versus short term capital gains but like the only way you can get rid of paying taxes is, is if you put put those proceeds directly into another real estate investment oh so, so like you have to keep moving sure. it forward. You do, yeah. So yeah. say I made 70K profit, yeah. took 20 of it, I'd have to pay tax on 20 of it, but the 50K could go into another property and not pay any taxes. Yeah. So that's, how, that's why real estate's cool, like if you can keep rolling it forward. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that's the capital gains tax of 30%. Yeah. So that's why flippers can't, that's why, because think about it, like flippers. Flippers would have to wait and renovate a whole year. They have to renovate but, and wait a yeah, whole year. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can't 1031 within a year either, because then, like, think about it. Flippers could, like, flip one, 1031 that into another flip. But, like, they only let you do it if it's, like, long term investments, like apartments. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, so these have been the successes and the failure. You gave us a couple examples of those. Awesome. Yeah, we, we did. Yeah. We, I think we, yeah, we, 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 did, yeah. we did enough of those. Um, okay, so then what's this whole deal with um, the short and long term? Rentals. What? What do you? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? I'll try to quickly. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to quickly go through this. So, um, I watched a lot of YouTube, and I was just one random night. I was just on. I was doing something. I had YouTube playing. Wasn't really paying attention, and for some reason, it this it caught my attention. This there was like this video with Grant Cardone and a guy named Brian Page, and Grant always like brings on people like to talk about new things in real estate. And this guy was talking about how literally he man he'll he'll manage other people's properties, put it on Airbnb forum, split the profit. So he started out where, you know, you go to a, you go to an apartment or say a house in Phoenix, they're asking 2000 a month, say, Hey, I'll give you the 2000 a month. As long as you let me rent it out in Airbnb and he'll make $5,000 a month. So and he, he was making, he said he had 10 properties, making him like over hundred K a month or like some ridiculous numbers. And I'm just thinking like in my head, like, okay, that's a legitimate service that people could use. So I was like, that makes a lot of sense. But we were, I was so busy with wholesaling and like this apartment stuff where I was like, God, I just can't take on something else. Like, it's just too much. I don't want to just half-ass all these different things. So I was like, how do I get somebody else? Or how do I like execute this idea without like disrupting that? So I sent it to two, good my buddy, two of my good buddies, sent them that exact video, said, hey, what are your thoughts? Both of them within 30 minutes, it was a 26 minute video. We're like, holy shit, we got to do that. So within two weeks, um, it was really lucky because my, one of the partners, Mitch, he was living in this downtown Sioux Falls apartment that um, for like two more weeks, I think. It was like two more weeks at the time. So we wanted to try it out. So he like took everything out of this apartment. It took us like a whole day, got this shit ready, learned everything about being the best Airbnb host. Cause all about getting five stars. And like, we put it on, the, put it on Airbnb for like seven nights. We made it available for seven nights within 24 hours, all seven nights were booked. And so we like went through that process, you know, met with like, checked them in, yada, yada, yada. It was actually, it was illegal, definitely illegal to do that. But we kind of wanted to get Why caught. Why was it illegal to do that? Because within the lease, you can't do that, within like leases. Oh, because he was still leasing it, yeah. He, but it was funny because his cousin was on the lease and he was just kind of living there for the summer. 
because it was his cousin. So, but we kind of wanted the, the apartment owner to come to us because we wanted to be like, hey, I mean, this is how much money, and we can do this for any we of the other vacant you, units. Yeah. yeah, so we were like, all right, this works. And then it quickly progressed to, um, my other partner, Reed, lives in Boca. His girlfriend has somebody that owns two vacation homes down there, asked if we could do that for them. And then another one in Wisconsin, this guy hit up one of our friends. The only person who knew we were doing it, somebody hit up her asking if she could help him do that. Mm -hmm. She sent him to us, yeah. we contact him. So we're in the process of those two because just literally three weeks ago we started this whole thing. And then just yesterday, Mitch went to um, visit two Sioux Falls lofts downtown. They were for rent. And he was just talking with the guy and the guy said, he just proposed it. Hey, will you let me do this if I pay you the 1500 a month in rent? The guy was all about it. We're waiting to hear back on the contract details and we're gonna just see if we can do it. So it, it really comes down to, I think that's a legitimate service because I talked to a lot of people since then. It and is, I was like, people want to stay in metropolises overnight or even in cities in the downtown areas and stuff. For the owners though Give too. them a night or two nights or three nights. The owners want something that like they guarantee that you pay them every month no matter what. Um, and so you're trying to fill the rooms. You also have to hire a cleaning service to come yep. in every one night or every five nights or however often people are coming in to, you have to deal with the rating systems on Airbnb and all that type of stuff. So yeah. it's, it is a lot of work. It actually is. It provides a good service for people. It's understandable. Um, at the same time, it, it does, in a sense, we do have to think about how it butterfly affects out and affects um, other people as well. Like literally, if that guy at that apartment complex was to be like, oh my gosh, we can make three times as much money doing all of this on Airbnb, why would I have long-term year-to-year tenants? I should just do it all on Airbnb. If the market demands that and then all, he can fill all those units, then in a sense, the question would be, what is actually more helpful for the creativity or for the productivity or for the um, or for just the overall community as well of these areas? Is is it that people can come through and and be creative, or is it better if long-term people are there trying to be productive in the cities and communities, or are we stripping out the communities from these cities and we're just having people that come through transiently over time, just quickly, so that they can do uh, just a quick contribution? So this is all so complex in terms of like economics, community, creativity, yeah. productivity. It's very tough to 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 get it all down, but that's probably why this recipe is so uh, complicated. It's, it's, and that's why it's probably also so difficult to have a, a nuanced conversation listing out all of the variables. This is why I want to do a, like a center for economic simulation. Like I care a lot about this idea. Like what would it look like to have, make a digital twin of the planet and then actually be able to deploy like a universal basic income to 300 million Americans and model, oh, awesome. and like model what would happen so that way you don't have a bunch of people speculating or so you know, you know what would happen or like a half a percent tax on all Wall Street transactions. Like what would happen to the most wealthy people that have to pay that tax and then where would that money go and what would happen to the basic needs of the people that need that money? Could they live healthier and happier lives at the expense of just a tiny little percentage on Wall Street transactions? So this is a very interesting um, idea that we're currently trying to pass along to other friends that work in the simulation space to see if we can actually move this forward. The same thing could be done to this example that we're talking about with this loft space in Sioux Falls. Like you could literally simulate out the city of Sioux Falls and what would happen if, the, be, owner, so if the owner did deploy all 30 of those lofts or whatever to Airbnb instead of long-term tenants and what would happen to the communities. These are very interesting questions. Yeah, yeah now you got me thinking about that stuff. God. Yeah, the universe, quick thought of the universal basic income. The problem with all those type of things is that you're relying on the government to you're relying you're, you're relying on the government to, to deploy that money that they have cor correctly. So are they going to why why do we think they're going to do it correctly? You know what I mean? That's my only issue with it. It's because like they might have the money, but are they going to distribute it the right way? You know? So that's a whole another conversation. But that's politics. That's politics. Yeah, we'll try to we'll try to just we're down <laughs> <Yeah>. with politics. <laughs> Andrew Yang, baby, UBI. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's cool. Yeah. Yeah, he's got some interesting. Yeah, but that's good. Things. Yeah, but with the Airbnb, to wrap it up. Yeah. So that's, that's short and long term rental. Also, potential. long term part of it, just quickly. Um, once I start getting apartment complexes, 
instead of hiring out property management companies, I'm gonna create, a, I'm gonna do it in house and create a separate arm, Metastone Property Management, so that like I can control the property management because that's that the way the way you win in apartments is that you have good property managers. Yeah. So I'm gonna make sure that they're good by creating that company. So that actually I haven't actually built that yet, but that's 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 a big key. That's what the long term rentals management is. So when you guys get down to Tempe and Phoenix, you guys are gonna be doing um, you're gonna be wholesaling real estate mostly down down there. That's the plan. I would say yep. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of wholesaling. Hopefully, try to get a couple houses. That we can do Airbnb just to get some, ca- just to get that. Which will be short-term rentals. Short-term rentals, and then, uh, and then really try and find our first apartment deal. Our big goal in 2019 was to get, you know, the wholesaling or whatever. But a big goal was to get a, a 20 unit or higher um, asset by the end of 2019. So, we've actually gotten closer than we thought, but that's not. So hopefully, it's still basically it's gonna, it's basically those three things: managing short-term rentals. Um, wholesaling and then trying to find uh, apartments. So that's that's what the companies do. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. This is this has been a really solid update. Let's do um, let's do some stuff uh, around this. I just you know I mentioned this to you and your team just a little bit ago um, over message. We were all talking about it. It's just the importance of turning what you're doing into a media company. We see it with Grant Cardone and Ryan Serhant and whatnot. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So you guys actually taking and basically uh, creating a, a, a vlog of your experience, a library of content around who you guys are, what you're doing, um, make it making it really fun and relatable for people to see, okay, maybe I can do this around the world. Maybe I can get inspired about this. Maybe I can get out of the nine to five and pursue entrepreneurship through these means. Maybe you can actually teach people about how to deal with buyers, sellers and this title company and make it so that in states where it's legal that people can find their own wholesale deals and you know this is actually interesting because if this guy didn't have you the one that was trying to get in 10 days just get the cash 22 grand he would have been sol for what he wanted to get done shit out of luck but yeah. you guys were there and so it's interesting like people can get their needs met yeah by having people like you around which is also interesting so Damn. yeah but what you, but you're but what you're saying what you're saying is like right like like the only reason we got that deal is because we we came across them online. But like what you're saying is like getting stuff out there because I've always wanted you to do that. You can document the fact that you did this deal yeah. for this guy, have it on your YouTube page, yep. and then you can literally link that 10 minute video to people that are, to the next person that calls you and says, hey, I need this property, I need to give you my property 50K cash. And you're like, yo, here's our video. Oh, I found you from this video because my friend sent it to me or whatever. And here's my big thing on that, and here's the reason I haven't done enough of that, and it's so, so stupid. You'll kind of understand what I'm saying, because I think I've talked to you about it before. I didn't want to do that, because I didn't want to be that guy that was like bragging about all this stuff. But then like it hit me, it was like, that's not bragging. You're literally just like showing people what you're doing, what you're doing. and literally creating value. You are creating like, value. That's all you're doing. Yeah. And then I, I saw a couple of real estate people that do that, that they're literally just documenting what they do. Not trying to be cocky, literally just showing people. They what are they just showing what and they do. I got so much value from it, so I was like, "Shit!" Like what I'm doing, like me, what me doing all. Like if we just show people what we're doing, like someone's gonna get value from that. Yeah. So that, once I got over that, like just internal battle, like I don't want to. Yeah. Then I was like, "Dude, it's it's no brainer." Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I'm pumped to start doing that for sure. I love it. Okay, good. And then um, and then also another good one is um, joining the conversations and as a, like a cocktail party style instead of a presentation party style. So like. The way it is, is like on Twitter, if you're looking up the hashtag real estate, that you can do things like just join what people are posting about it and just say, here's a really relevant interview or video or vlog from our site, from our channel, about what this thread is currently talking about. More people will hear about you, more people will like and retweet those posts. And so the general idea is that you don't just want to be messaging, tweeting directly from your page and just saying, hey, everyone, look at what we're doing. But you also want to be joining all the conversations happening every single hour about real estate, not only around the world, locally as well. So like putting those two things together is going to be really critical, like your own YouTube channel and your own social marketing strategies for cocktail party style. You're joining the party instead of just presenting to people. Yeah. Yeah. It all comes down to just being, you gotta be in the digital age. You gotta be good digitally. Yeah. Yeah, you've probably, you've obviously you've learned a lot doing that. But it's, yeah. it's interesting too. It I is. I love being online. It's fun too, creating like shit like this, awesome. You, 
it's going to be so critical for you guys to do this. And <laughs> I can't. I'm we're going to couch like this in our office. I was telling you. Exactly. I'm so pumped. Just throw up. Yeah. Just throw up the camera in in the little. Just do stuff like this. Little like, mic and just capture it. That's right. Yeah, it's going to be great. How about um, your relationship with the divine, with God, source, spirit, <coughs> all that is? What's been your creation? Yeah. So I, you told me this was going to you kind of preparing for this question, didn't know what. I've been asking this question to almost all of our guests really recently, because I think it's super important. It's not enough people talk about this yeah, question. And I don't really know how, the way you're gonna, this, this is kind of just, this is the way I think about like, the divine. So I think that everybody believes in something, a higher power, because if you don't, I mean, it's, I don't know, I just feel like your life's gonna be, I mean, that's tough. Mm -hmm. You gotta believe that something's up there. There's a higher power. I don't think there's any doubt that there's a higher power. Mm -hmm. And I think all I think all the religions are just different interpretations of that higher power. That's right. But but my interpretation, I'm I'm Christian, and that's fine. Like I believe in Christian Christianity, but I don't like to talk about it because I don't know that I'm right. I just know my that's just what I believe. But at the same time, I never say like, oh God did this to me. What I say is, ah, oh, the universe. That was a great lesson from the universe. Because I like to talk in terms of that because some people, a lot of people aren't. They're not religious. Um, but I feel like everybody can relate to a higher power. Yeah. The universe happening for us. Yeah. Um, that's so, that, so that's me. So I'm not a big, I, and I'm a Christian, I believe in it, but I'm not, I don't like to talk about it, say that I'm right, because I just don't think there's, there's not a right religion. Yeah. And I hate when people try to tell you that their religion is right, yeah. because yeah. It's, <laughs> cause don't you think it's all an interpretation of something? Yeah. That's what I think. If it's all an interpretation of a higher power, yep. it's, and it's, Everyone's going to have their own unique communion with that higher power. Yeah. Everyone has their own unique experience. And so it's not about my communion is better than yours. Anyone that starts talking like that, it's not actually... Isn't that tough? It's, it's just not actually worthy. spiritually developed. That per, that it's more becomes more about a bragging process or about exerting power over someone else and saying that your, your process is inferior, your divine communion's inferior to mine. So I'm glad that you say that. And if we can see our lives as a, a series of of uh, unleashing our gifts as a channel, th having God or creation or this higher power come through us to help us bring our gifts forth. Everything has lessons. We're gaining experience points. You know, this game near these, we were big gamers when we were younger that we're literally gain gaining experience points and we're gaining accolades and we're leveling up. We're defeating bosses. We're you literally are, it's literally a game. Yeah. Life's a game, yeah. if you think about it the right way. But some people don't think of it as a game. They don't, they don't look for those lessons. They don't look for those like, what you were saying, it just comes together. Yeah. Like the universe comes together. If you look for it, though, and that sounds so hokey, but it really isn't. You have to be a seeker. You have to. You have to like tell it what you want, and then it, and yeah. then you, you'll get hints if you, you look for hints, them. Yeah. It's just get and take you, in the morning and at night. Instead of just rolling over and grabbing your phone, tap into your body and your divine purpose, and really try and like really envision what your successful future looks like and how you're going to achieve it and you'll see more and more synchronicities going in that direction because you're you're catalyzing that process with the divine versus when you're rolling over and succumbing to algorithms. God, I know. It's, isn't that just, if you think about, that's why I love always talking to you because not that many people get this deep about it and it's, I feel weird talking to other people about this stuff but it's so true like, like if you think about like that, like the amount of people who don't have this mindset and it's not like a superior, I don't know, it's not a superior mindset, it's just, I think it's the mindset you should have, but no one else, not that many people have it. It's like they don't We're think about We're not given life. the other option that much either, yeah. as in you have to know that the other option exists. When was the last time that someone mentioned to you, hey, hey, you know that time that you spend um, in that news feed? You can actually spend that time like creatively endeavoring <laughs> because yeah, people, there's just like, no, when I'm there and I'm in line or I am just have my spare time, like it's immediate now that we just go to the news feed. So we need to know that the other options exist. Like what would happen if I just asked the person next to me, you know, hey, what's your name? What's your divine purpose in this world? Tell me about who you are. Like what creative lesson could come from that process? I can get better at socializing. I can get better at empathizing. I can learn about someone else's divine power, but I have to be willing to know that there's other things on the tool belt than looking through a fucking news feed during that, during that little time that I have. I agree. I, I completely agree. And just, just to your point about ask, talking to people and asking good questions and 
trying to like actually get them to say something. Dude, I've done that a lot lately. Like, dude, you, you learn, you meet people, you have better conversations, but like, you feel like they're happy to talk about it. It's yeah. so much nicer when you start, when you get them to talk about stuff that they like. That they like. So much yeah. better. People love talking about themselves, <laughs> but there's not enough people that they're, are out there asking questions. And, and to willing, to listen. willing to listen. Willing to listen. You gotta no one does those. that. Ask questions, be willing to listen, everyone. I Even, love that. That's and great. something from uh, and <laughs> Ed Milet, he, if yeah. uh, something like this, if you're like if you're talking, the, the first sign that you can tell that somebody's not listening is if like as they're talking. Like, oh yeah, for sure, yep, yep. Like, it's like, they're like giving you a nudge to like be done talking. It's oh, like, yeah. which I never thought about like that, yeah. but it's like, just listen to them. And then like, yeah. and then even if like, after they're done talking, give them two seconds, see if they want to add anything. And then, all right, just little things like that, exactly. dude. And like, I you're pulling a good uh, interview uh, skill. Most people don't know about that one, that you got to give an extra couple seconds yeah. when someone finishes talking. Because they always have a follow up. They, you know they always yeah. have a follow up. Or he comes up. Yeah. Because they, 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 they were doing the associative web in their in their brain talking about it, and then they pause and they're looking yeah. at you, and then all of a sudden the brain's still figuring, oh, and then they go and then they go with the next thing. Yeah. When I heard that the first time, I tried it the next day, and like right away, like it, it feels weird giving them two seconds, but they almost always say something else. Yeah, it's beautiful. Also, nonverbal communication. So just when someone's done talking, just look at them in the eyes and just go like. <laughs> you don't even need to say yeah you don't even need to say words just literally looking at them and being like you can I, give I you. you can give the look of i feel you or that was dope or that was so interesting by just looking at them you know these so the fact that like most people don't know that the reason why eyebrows exist is yes partly because of uh, for being able to um, absorb additional sunlight and blocking our eyes so that we can then see better so our eyebrows contribute to that but people also but people also strongly believe that even more potentially percent of um, the reason why we have eyebrows is for nuanced facial expressions. Interesting, really. Yeah. So that, wow. yeah, our, us, yeah, that's <laughs> right. So many all things. of the different eyebrow expressions, you know, all the different things that you can yeah, do like that's, that. Yeah. There's that's millions so of emotional expressions that you can do without using your voice. Yeah, and even things like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> we gotta be appropriate with it, obviously, yeah. but like, yeah. dude, like, Things like, like walking up behind somebody, like that's what I'm talking about. Grab on the shoulders. That's what I'm talking about, man. Like just, like people love that stuff. But yeah, like it's so simple. Emotional intelligence. I remember right when I like learned about the concept. But that's it's all it is. Like if you, I mean, how terrible is it when somebody is just talking, 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 talking about something they've done? It's like, dude, nice. Like you don't want to be like a, a dick, but it's like you leave that conversation just really not appreciating or not really wanting to go hang out with them again. That's kind of what I feel. But then like, and then when you do get in like a conversation like with you or somebody else that has like good conversations, because a lot of people, they don't even know the concept of a good conversation. But the people that do, it's great. Like my buddy Connor Grevlos, you, oh, I would, oh, I wish we could hang out with him too. Cause he's one of those guys where every time I hang out with him, I know we're going to have a good conversation. Cause yeah. I know we're going to listen to each other, talk about good ideas, but not that many people do that. So many people, dude, last night at Pave downtown, it was, that was great. I was just like, dude, I do not care. Cause I wasn't there. I don't care about what you did downtown at Pave. Cause there's definitely nothing productive. But you don't want to say that because you sound, you come off, you know, the Although wrong way. you did meet that uh, Brookings guy at one of those. Uh, hey, right? Yeah. See, right. So and that's another interesting point in nuance because I'm always frequently telling people there's nothing really that productive at bars or clubs yeah. or all that type of stuff. And but then you got to be open minded. You got to be somewhat thing, open minded yeah. to that type of stuff. Okay, let's talk about um, where do you think we come from? Do you think that um, our spirit meets this body? for this lesson on the planet? Well, I mean, I think we know how the, the body's made. But I don't know, I don't know do where the spirit comes from. I don't know where, the, do I don't think, know where that comes from. Do you think it emerges biologically? Do you think that it potentially comes and takes a seat in the body? The spirit or the soul comes, takes a seat in the body, and then it transitions, you know, pre-birth and post-death. It just goes back and cyclical. How do you think that process I think works? So I, got, I, I don't. I think that it. I think that it. It, it comes. It comes into us from the higher power. That's what I think. Yeah. But I've, that's what I've, a lot of people think. But I have no idea. I, I have no reason to think that I'm right. Yeah. I have no idea. It's an interesting. It uh, is. It is because it could be. Because what do you think? Like what? 
I that don't know seems what to think, be the like, prevailing. What's the, other, what's the other? What's the other side of it? The other side of it is that we emerge um, from um, uh, from the from the from the ground from the from just like the most like nihilistic, um, the most non-theistic, the most atheistic perspective is just that we just this rock orbited the star and we got lucky that it emerged in this habitable zone and that we evolved from single cell to multi-cell life the asteroid came destroyed the dinosaurs to make room for us to evolve and it's just pure luck and every single time that a consciousness rises inside of a inside of a body that it's just pure luck that we're here and that it's uh, just pure biological process that consciousness occurs here and then literally once you die that's it nothing happens it's just your consciousness died and that's it there's no spirit there's no soul none of that so stuff like, is so true. like once you get so like once you get pregnant as like, well as they the, even think there's no higher power they even think that this is like the most extreme idea is just that it literally when you ask them about big, big bang there's like we have no idea but big bang just happened and that's just what this is it's just there's no higher power but yeah continue on the pregnancy one that's that's the complete opposite yeah. side of of the, like there is a higher power and we are solar spirit coming through these yeah bodies. so like when you get pregnant and then like whatever it goes either the embryo or whatever goes through so like in those nine months the consciousness grows just out of that just biologically that's yeah okay. yeah the consciousness is a property of uh information processing and i mean that's the closest and some people say that plants also due to literally if like a bug takes a bite out of a plant the plant will literally have a stress response and so that's technically information processing that the plant is processing that the bug bit them and that they now have to have a defense mechanism to make sure that they don't pass. Yeah, I, mean, I, can, I can see why people think that because I mean there's obviously a reason people think that. Unless but like they're just they ignorant. think a dog is quite conscious but a plant is like oh well how conscious is a plant right or but a plant is pretty conscious. They're all conscious. I th and see, that's what panpsychists believe is I that everything is conscious. I think they're all I think everything's conscious. Yeah that's but, what a lot of people but think they're too. all different 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 consciousness levels I guess. And then, We're the most conscious, don't you think? See, that's a Dep very interesting, <laughs> hubristic, <laughs> self-confident perspective on that. <laughs> self-confident It is overly self-confident in a sense because technically you look, you do, you look at uh, the kind of like you look at the inner rhythm of a lot of other uh, animals, um, especially like aquatic animals or just even, even like your household pets. Like how much, how interesting is it that the way that the intelligence of, 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 of dolphins or bats or there's all these other snakes, there's things that can like see an infrared or use ultrasound or all these types of things that we don't have. We do, we haven't trained, we haven't evolved for those things. They like some sleep, I believe it's a dolphin that's sl that the sleeps dolphins, yeah, see there. with half their brain. Uh, yeah. Or, so like uni hem hemispherically sleeps with only one side of their hemisphere sleeping and the other side. I heard so, dolphins are way smarter than us. So <laughs> and same with the octopi, you know, all this type of stuff. So the so one of the one of the questions is like, what have humans actually evolved our perceptional abilities? Because right now it looks like our perceptional abilities is pretty much to like eat, sleep, reproduce and then work and usually in working we're building civilization but how often are we training these faculties of like communing with the divine on like a normal basis like how good can you be at <coughs> communing with the divine to the point where it's basically your second nature to be tapped into a higher power all the time every breath of air give every me example give me an example of like what do you mean because I don't even know. I don't even know how to do like that. Like your body right now, you have like you know your heart's beating a hundred thousand times a day. You're like you know your autonomic so nervous system. So be tapped conscious of like that type of stuff. Be, you mean be really conscious of that type of stuff and like you know your autonomic nervous system is what's helping you breathe because you're not consciously going. <sighs> wow. Right, and so the idea is like, can you more consciously go? <clears throat> Can you more consciously, when you drink water or go to the shower, can you more consciously be grateful for that water that's sustaining you, okay, or yeah, that's cleaning you? Yeah. Same thing with your food that you eat. Can you literally connect to the divine before you eat your food? Interesting. Yeah, I know what you mean now. So was, those yeah, types of I things. I, yeah. Because that's I where like that human stuff too. possibility lies. Is our possibility lies in that, but we're so overly consumed with what is just mundane and repetitive. For, for those who don't, for those who, um, that too many, too many like scientific words, I think basically what you meant is like, 
be grateful for the little things. Don't you think? In a more basic basic way. Sure. Be, be great. Yeah. Or at least like like understand yeah. like oh god that water was great for my body you know like yeah I don't know. It, the it, really small stuff yeah little small stuff yeah but they're also the things that sustain us the most and that's why people like these indigenous tribes around the planet are all saying that is our disconnection from nature the fact that water sustains us food sustains us the air sustains us of this planet literally this planet sustains us and our disconnection from that process is the reason why we're trashing our planet and that's why we have so many of the issues in our civilization so literally, if we could heal our connection to the planet, our connection to this, literally this thing that sustains us, that then that wisdom would unlock our harmony with nature, our harmony with each other, and solve so many of the problems that we have. There's a lot of problems. No, that's, there's, yeah, there's... There's a lot of beautiful things, but a lot of problems. Let's see what, yeah, you're, I wish, I mean, I, a lot of, uh, California, a lot of people think that way. Not enough people think that way. That's why, you don't, I, you don't get that perspective up here. You just don't, no one talks about it. Yeah, it's, it's, there's, a, there's even more ways to dive into that. We'll say, <laughs> how about, uh, I don't think we asked you this last time, are we in a simulation? Um, I think you did. In so, I think in some ways. I mean, we're in a game. I think we're in a game. Yeah. I play it like it's a simulation. No, see, this is where I don't think it's a simulation. I don't, I don't know. I think it's a game. Someone's controlling it. I mean, shit, Christians, if you're a Christian, you isn't a simulation. If you think about it, wouldn't it be? If you think Jesus and everything, they're controlling everything, aren't, aren't they the creators of the simulation? I don't know. I think, I, I, look at, I look at life as a simulation, where whoever's running it is giving me options, throwing me obstacles, and I'm just <laughs> kicking them down. Seriously, dude, like, it, it, to me, it's a game. I don't know if it's, yeah. I, I don't know if, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know if I'm gonna go all the way to, like, Elon Musk's, uh, Radical version of the simulation, but I, I don't know. That's, yeah. that's a tough question. And then, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Um, I just think the power to, or I think the most beautiful thing is that you can always, you can do whatever you want. You, you can always change your story, and there's no limits. And I think too many people put limits on themselves, and I just think it's beautiful that if you really think about it, there's no limits, and you can tomorrow you can change your entire story. So I think. I love that one. You like it? It's really beautiful, yeah. yeah. There's no limits. Tomorrow you can change your story. Seriously, like, I don't yeah. care if you have a shitty job, fucking quit, figure it out. That's what I think. Too many people, I just, too many people are just. Especially they're, if you don't have a family and if you don't have kids, too, then it's yeah. even easier. Especially, yeah. yeah. And I just, I just hate that too many people playing vict the victim card. I can't do this. It's like, dude, come on, man. Like, you can really live in that type of mindset your whole entire life. Especially when you're in your deathbed and you're like, Oh my God. I never learned who I am. I don't know who I am. What did I do? I worked with like, yeah. Then, and that type of stuff, it, that type of stuff's real. I mean, it's if, you, real. if you think about that. It plagues our society. People don't get to unlock their gifts and bring them to the world. Absolutely. And we need to help children do that as fast as possible. More effectively. Absolutely. What a fucking awesome round two. Great combo. Super fun. Oh awesome. yeah. I was, I, <laughs> Always a pleasure. Last time I didn't know we were going to do it, I'll, since I was pumped all day for it. Good, bro. Good. And we yeah. got, got all the equipment too. Yeah, 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 we had the equipment this time. I love it. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on our conversation. Yep, absolutely. Let us know what you're thinking about real estate in general. Let us know what you're thinking about real estate investing, These, this idea of finding off-market properties, real estate wholesaling, managing short and long-term rentals, and also apartment syndications. Let us know what you're thinking about those things. Go and have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online on social media about these topics as well about everything from also rent seeking and capitalism all the way to um, understanding how to create a better social fabric for unleashing people's gifts, all these great topics. Check out the links in the bio below to metastonecap.com as well as webuyhomesufalls.com and the top tier mg.com as well. Find all those links below. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations in your communities that you believe in. Support them and help them grow. Support simulation, our links are below. You can find our Patreon, cryptocurrency, PayPal links down below, as well as our design cool merch. You get paid all that stuff's in the links below. Go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Have a good night. Peace. Peace.